Before we get deep into this, do me a quick favour and subscribe to Iron Age Instincts if you haven't already. This channel exists for people who actually care about how our ancestors solved real problems with limited resources, and subscribing helps keep this kind of serious research alive and visible. If you've ever wondered how Iron Age smiths produced workable steel long before industrial mines, blast furnaces, or standardized alloys, this is one of those topics that quietly rewrites everything you think you know. Bog ore was not a poor substitute for real iron. In many regions, it was the iron economy. What makes it fascinating is that, when handled correctly, bog ore could yield tool steel capable of holding an edge, surviving impact, and being repaired endlessly in the field. That knowledge largely vanished, not because it didn't work, but because centralised mining replaced local mastery. Why bog ore mattered more than most modern histories admit? Bog ore forms in wetlands where iron-rich groundwater meets oxygen and precipitates iron oxides. To Iron Age communities, this meant iron literally regenerated in the landscape. Harvested areas could refill within decades. This changed how people thought about resources. Iron wasn't something imported from distant mountains. It was something gathered like timber or clay. That accessibility drove widespread tool ownership regional blade styles, and constant experimentation at the village level. What often gets missed is that bog ore is chemically complex. It frequently contains manganese, phosphorus, and trace elements that affect hardenability and toughness. Some deposits produced iron that carburized easily and responded beautifully to quenching. Others were better suited for softer tools. Skilled smiths learned their local ore the way a modern bladesmith learns a specific steel batch. Now, how did Iron Age smiths process bog ore into usable iron? Well, the process actually began with drying and roasting the ore, mainly to drive off moisture and organic matter. This step really mattered, you know. Wet ore wastes fuel and honestly lowers the bloom quality. Roasting also converted iron compounds into forms that reduced more efficiently in the furnace. Archaeological evidence shows that roasting pits were positioned upwind of bloomery sites, which suggests a deliberate workflow rather than, say, simple improvisation. Smelting took place in small bloomery furnaces, often no taller than a person's waist. Charcoal was layered with crushed ore, and air was introduced through clay tuyeres using bellows. Temperatures never actually reached melting point. Instead, oxygen was stripped from the ore, forming a spongy bloom of iron mixed with slag. This bloom was then consolidated under hammer blows, forcing slag out and welding iron particles together. For anyone attempting this today, the key lesson is control rather than brute heat. Overheating ruins blooms. Turning bloom iron into blade-worthy steel. Bloom iron straight from the furnace was usually low carbon. The real skill came next. Smiths carburized iron by repeated heating in charcoal-rich environments, allowing carbon to diffuse into the surface. Folding and forge welding distributed that carbon more evenly. You know, this wasn't decorative. It was actually functional metallurgical correction. 
Some Iron Age blades, well, they show steeled edges forge welded onto softer spines. Others, though, achieved variable carbon through controlled working alone. This created tools that were hard where they needed to cut and tough where they needed to survive. And honestly, when you handle original Iron Age blades, the balance feels intentional, not crude. If you apply this today, even on a small scale, you can reproduce similar results using bloom iron, a charcoal forge, and, well, just a bit of time. Carburize thin bars rather than thick ones. Normalize often. Test hardness with simple file checks instead of chasing modern Rockwell numbers. Heat treatment without modern theory still worked remarkably well. Quenching media varied by region. Water, brine and sometimes oil rendered from animal fats all appear in historical contexts. What mattered was consistency. This is one of the most practical takeaways for modern survivalists and experimental archaeologists. You don't need thermocouples to heat treat steel. You need observation, repeatable conditions, and honestly, a willingness to ruin a few blades while learning. Now, why was bog or steel so ideal for survival tools, you might wonder? Well, it's because bog or steel was, in fact, repairable. Blades made from this material could be reforged over and over again without facing catastrophic failure. That's really thanks to the moderate carbon levels and the way grain growth was kept in check by frequent forging. For modern applications, this mindset is, well, really valuable. A knife made from bloom steel can be resharpened endlessly, reforged after damage, and, you know, modified as needs change. What this teaches us about Iron Age intelligence and adaptability is quite remarkable. Bog or blades weren't accidents of primitive technology. They were actually the result of intimate environmental knowledge and long-term experimentation. Communities understood their land at a chemical level, even if they lacked modern vocabulary. If you want to apply this knowledge today, start by, you know, learning your local materials. Identify iron-rich soils. Experiment with small furnaces. And honestly, accept failure as data. That's exactly how Iron Age metallurgy advanced. This is the kind of knowledge that really deserves to be preserved and shared. If this deep dive added something new to your understanding of early metallurgy, subscribe to Iron Age Instincts. Share this video with someone who takes history seriously and help keep these forgotten skills alive.